What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're gonna to be going over double inputs within the input buffer and command buffer system that we've got. So in the past, our input buffer system did not support double inputs. So like light attack, light attack, or you know, two forwards, like for a forward dash, or two backwards for a backward dash. Uh, the system did not support that. So we're gonna make it support that today. I do have the output log here, which I'm gonna make readily available so you can see what's going on as I press the buttons because we did not fill out any of the dash logic yet so you won't be able to see any actual dash mechanics but you'll be able to see that it's working from the log messages okay so a double input like I said forward forward you can see characters using the command forward dash and if I click into the mutant character BP and go to class defaults and go to character commands you can see forward dash has two inputs, which is forward, forward. So now we are having these double inputs actually work with the other input buffer logic we have. I've removed a lot of the log spam. So right now we are only seeing what uh, commands we are using. So if I were to do like this, I do fireball. And if player two did this, they'd also do fireball. Um, you can dash, of course, with each player. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, like I said, there's not much to show for it because we haven't done the dash logic yet, but this is insanely important because also if you want to do like multiple attacks like this, if you want to press light attack twice and do a different attack or, you know, start an auto combo, we need the ability to perform, to be able to press the same button two or more times in a row and get appropriate functionality. So, before we get started here, this is episode, I believe, four of the advanced input buffer system, but we are going off of the input buffer system that we used initially and just continuously uh, making it better. So if you want to catch up in the series, we are on episode 67, so we have quite a bit of, of episodes behind us. If you want to catch up, I'll post the first episode to the entire series right here, along with the playlist. But if you don't care about that, I'll go ahead and just post the first input buffer episode. If you watch all the input buffer episodes, you should be able to get to this point without looking at the rest of the series. Okay. So what we need to do is basically determine why our system wasn't set up for multiple inputs and then fix it. I mean, that's pretty much anything in code, right? Specifically, with our input system, the issue that we were having is a more complicated one. It's not one I'm going to completely cover in depth. Basically what was going on is we had no way, no way to s determine what inputs were supposed to be for what command, right? I mean, think about it. You have a list of say 30 commands for your character and you, you press forward. Well, forward's going to be in a lot of commands. It's going to be your regular move command, your dash. It can be used for directional attacks. So we have to loop through them all. End of story. We have to. That's the only way we can compare inputs. But we were looping through, and we weren't resetting our correct sequence counter when we performed a command, which is one thing. You may not want to do this all the time, and there's special cases that we can handle later. But for our normal commands, for any command that's not a combo command... So basically a command with buffered input to another command, then we'll want to do this. And that's good. That's a good start. But the other issue was that we were never, we basically have to make uh, certain inputs inactive after they've been used. So think about this logic for a second. I have this new Boolean called, called was use, which we'll cover in a minute. And basically, this is determining if the input in the input buffer was already used. And if it was, we don't want to use it again. So there was nothing stopping us from, say, the last input we pressed was forward. But before that, we had pressed, you know, backward. Or we had pressed light attack or something. So now the, the input that's being registered as a potential input for to execute a command is forward which is the last index of our input buffer. So we go through, we add correct sequence counter and say, yes, we've gotten one correct. Then we go to the next command, which happens to be forward dash. So the commands are forward forward, 
Well, our correct sequence counter is now one. So when we go through the logic here, we do input buffer one, which remember we had light attack and then we had forward is what gets checked. So we had a forward input that got checked and then we added to our correct sequence counter, went to the next command, and then we had another forward. Because of that, we have forward forward in our input buffer, or, or at least that's what got checked in our input buffer against our command, which is the command for forward dash. And if that's confusing, good, it should be. Because uh, we're not, you know, without seeing it, it's hard to, to understand. So let me write this down for you. So say we were on command that was, I don't know. We can just do forward dash. We don't have to make it any more complicated than it is. So say we have forward dash, pretend that's an FD, and then the commands are forward. Wow, I'm not good at this. Forward, forward, okay? Forward dash is forward, forward. And then we did, this is our IB, our input buffer. Okay, I feel like I got worse at this the last time we did it. This is our input buffer, and we've done backward, forward. Okay. Not boyfriend, but backward forward. So at this point, we are looping through our commands. Okay, remember we have to loop through our current commands and then our command inputs. And we only break if we get a value we want. And then we loop out of that, or we break out of that input. So say we're, we're going through our command here and our command is forward forward. Well, in our input buffer, we have backward forward. So the first one's gonna fail out. Backward does not match forward or forward. But then we go to the next input because of this loop right here, which is forward. So this is gonna succeed. And then we're going to add one to correct sequence counter. So correct sequence counter plus, plus, how about that? Basically saying we increment correct sequence counter, add one to it. Great. Now our correct sequence counter is one. Now we break out of this for loop because we found a matching input. And we only break out, when you do break, you only break out of the uh, lowest level that you're, so basically the scope that you're currently in of the for loop. So we break out of this loop and then we go to this one. So this is your command input. So this is where we loop through each command. So this was where we started. We started on F. And now we're moving to the next command, which is F, okay? Then we go into the input buffer here. We go into the for loop again, and we make sure that it's in, you know, an appropriate index. And then we do input buffer input, which is zero, plus correct sequence counter, which is one. Where well, input buffer looks like this, backward forward. So even though it failed out of the first, first try, it's still in here. Then we're using index one to determine what we're checking against. Index one is forward here. So then forward also matches forward, which means we add the correct sequence counter again, which means we have forward forward as the command that matched, which means we use forward dash anytime we press forward. And that's the issue. So that's the problem we were having and that's why we, don't, it, we weren't supporting multiple keys before because we had no way to determine what position we were at when we started matching a command. So there's a few things we have to do to fix this. I'm going to close this now, but hopefully that made more sense seeing it in action. Okay. So the, um, let's start with going to the structure. So in our fighter template character, we have a structure called F input info. And this is basically what gets put into our input buffer. We have our input type, which is the actual type, like forward, backward. We have the input name, which is the name of the key or button. We have the timestamp, that way we know when to remove it. And then we have a new Boolean I've added here, was used. So go ahead and add this to your structure. And this was used will just determine if we've already used this input when checking uh, this command. So you, can, you, know, you can't just set it to be was used and never use it again. If we use it and it fails out of a command and goes to another command. So if it doesn't work for forward dash, but maybe it works for a directional forward attack, then that's perfectly fine. But we don't want to use the same input for two different command inputs on the same check. So go ahead and make this Boolean, was used. And then we can go back into our check input buffer for command using type. 
and then you'll see I'm doing something new here. So let's go through the logic again. Now we have correct sequence counter is equal to zero, okay? And we, we go through our commands. We've been doing this the whole time. But now every time we go through a new command, I go ahead and set all the input buffers back to false. All the inputs in the input buffer back to was used false. This way, every time we start a new command, you know, there's no data being left over. We don't need to have any data saying it was already used or don't check it because now we're at a new command. We want to have complete uh, free range of what our inputs can do here. So this is just your standard for loop. You guys, as you can tell by this function, this function has a lot of them. But input is equal to zero. Input is less than input buffer dot num. Add to input, we'll increment input. And then we do input buffer input dot was used equals false. So basically just reset everything. It's a clean slate. None of them were used. Now this is, these are the same, all these lines. The only thing that's different here is when we start getting into checking for a match. So this if statement, this really long one here, previously, the thing that is highlighted was not here. The rest of it was here. This is where we're checking our input type from the input buffer to the input type of the command buffer. We're making sure that our inputs actually match. That way we know that we've pressed the correct inputs. But in this case, we also need to make sure that this input was not already used. So not exclamation mark input buffer. We need the same index that we're going to be using. So input plus correct sequence counter dot was used. And that's what two ampersands are. These are the little and signs. Sorry, I was trying to highlight them for you. So if if the input buffer at this input, if the input at this location in the input buffer was not used, and it's a match, then we go into this logic. And then the only difference here is we take the input buffer again at that index and set was used to true. That way it does not get used again until it gets set back to false or unless it, or until it's removed from the input buffer, in which case if it's removed, then we won't use it anyway. So it's not a big deal, but we will never use it twice for the same command. And because of that, we won't have issues where we can't press a button multiple times in a row. All right. And make sure you do this before you do plus plus correct sequence counter. If you do it in the other order, then you'll get a crash or potentially get a crash because you have added to correct sequence counter and then you're still using it in the index. But we only check to see if input plus correct sequence counter is less than input buffer dot num. Whereas you're adding another one to it here. So eventually you're, you could actually get an out of range error if you do this in the other order. So make sure you put this above where you're adding to the correct sequence counter. And then as another safeguard, I go ahead and set correct sequence counter back to zero when we start command. Now, remember, there, there are times you may not want to do this, but we can actually single them out per attack or per section. So basically, we can have, if we have certain commands that we can use that are, say, the same inputs minus like one or two things are added on the end, then we can actually separate them and have one command start as the starting command and then have have the user need to press the other inputs in the same succession to use the next command and we can cancel out of it and go to that one. So there's no real harm in doing it this way. We do need to do this one way or another. We do need to reset it when we use the command. That way we don't use multiple commands at the same time that we're not supposed to. But I just wanted to let you, um, let you be aware of that because it is something we have to consider. So set correct sequence counter back to zero, and then the rest of the logic is the same. We break and then we do all this stuff. I've commented out the three logs in here because it was just getting to be too much. It is very useful when debugging one or two commands, but now that I have like six or seven commands, it's just printing all these ones that failed. And you know, it just failed because I wasn't pressing the right inputs for that command. <laughs> like if I'm doing four or four dash in my, in my, uh, inputs are like light attack, light attack, then yeah, it's gonna fail, but I wasn't trying to use that command. So it gets very messy really quickly with these comments. I'm gonna leave them in, just comment it out, just in case I need to use them again for testing. But that's basically all the code. There is um, some, There are some things we have to do in Blueprint as well. So I'm gonna launch the editor.
and I'm going to go into my mutant character BP or whatever character you have your add to input buffer logic in. Now you can see this is cleaned up quite a bit and it's because I've shoved, shoved it into this function. So what we need to do here is change the way we were removing values from our input buffer. What I said in the code make, should hopefully make sense at this point as to why we were getting these issues where double inputs weren't working. They were either not working entirely because they were getting skipped or they were working when you would press the button once because they were getting used more than one time. But we have another issue that will still stop us from uh, doing what we need to do here. We were calling remove in our logic. So I'm going into this function. Whoops, let me... Uh, I'm going into this function here, and this should look somewhat familiar, but it's going to be pretty much completely different. I mean, it's the same logic, but I did have to change the whole way we're looping through and things, and I'll show you why. But remember, in the event graph, we had these add to input buffer P1, add to input buffer P2. We were removing them based on the timestamp, and then we go ahead and add them to the input buffer. All this logic for both player one and player two about adding to the input buffer has stayed exactly the same. The only thing we're looking at today is removing the old inputs from the buffer. So go ahead and make a new function. I called it remove old inputs from buffer. And I give it a fighter template character uh, input parameter. And this is because remember player one, if we're using the keyboard like we do, then we need to make sure we have our player two reference because our controller won't, our controller won't care right? It doesn't mind. It's a new, it's a new player. It'll pick up on the add the input buffer, but on a keyboard, we need to specify who this input is for, and we need to use the player two reference. So just pass along the reference. Okay. If it's, if it's add to input buffer P2, uh, I do a validated get on the player two reference, which you should already have in this logic. And then you just drag it into the character reference slot here which is my input parameter that I made. You can just uh, click plus new parameter here to edit input parameter. And then for player one, I just pass in self. Because if it's player one, then we know it's this character. And player one won't really have issues as you're aware of. All right. And now you can basically uh, remove or copy the functionality we had here to remove old inputs and put it into this function. I'm gonna go over the entire function again anyway, so you can flat out remove it if you want and we'll go over it together. Just make sure you do connect your lines and you've got the add input to input buffer after you call this new function now. Okay, we don't wanna stop any of that logic, we just need to change the way we're doing remove. I just wanna make that clear so that no one deletes anything. All right. So let's go into this function and it should make more sense why I'm doing it this way. All right. So the way we were removing inputs from our input buffer is actually incorrect. You're not supposed to try and access and update an array at the same time. Technically it's possible and it's possible under a lot of different circumstances. So it depends on your container. It depends on, you know, potentially different threads. It depends on a lot of things. Right now, making it simple, you should not be accessing an array while you're updating it. Mainly, I mean, more than anything, you don't want to be accessing it while you're writing to it. Is uh, it is that'll be the the way that they put it. If you get an error or crash, be like array accessed during write method or something like that. Which basically means you're trying to get a value from it while it's being updated. Especially, you don't want to try and get a value from it while things are being removed because you can also, on top of that error that you can already get, you can get an error or a crash for accessing an index that doesn't exist or going out of bounds. So there's a lot of issues with the way we were doing it in the past. Now we were using a for each loop. So since we were using the for each loop, it's actually not a big deal. The for each loop uses a, um, it uses a get that is not a reference does not use the ref, it uses the copy. 
So it wasn't actually hurting us. We weren't changing values within the array. We were just looking at the values in the array. Like we were grabbing the timestamp that we got from the copy and then removing that. But really, in all actuality, that doesn't really hurt us because, again, it was a copy, not a reference. However, we need to make sure that we can remove these values from the array appropriately. If we don't, they're going to linger in the input buffer here to be checked against for too long. We're only removing them when we press an input. When we press an input, we check to see if it should be removed from the buffer before adding to it. So if it was unable to remove it from the buffer, we'll get multiple inputs in our input buffer that we don't want if it's unable to remove it because it's being written to at the time. To so say a user is pressing something and it's pressing something that happens to modify what we need to access. And it's okay if that doesn't make sense. I'll go over it. But my point is we needed to update our remove logic because our remove logic was not actually doing what we need to do to make the input buffer work completely. There were technically some hidden inputs that were getting put in there that weren't getting removed right away. And that's why sometimes inputs would not work. Again, like double inputs or multiple of the same input in a row, they were not working because the way we were removing them was actually not correct. Let's go over this logic. So I drag off the character reference to use the input buffer. This is the only time I use it. So to get this out of the way and make it not confusing, the character reference we brought in, the only three places it gets used in this function are every time I get input buffer. <laughs> so, okay, that should be perfectly clear. I'm not using this anywhere else. You could flat out get input buffer at the start and then just drag off of this everywhere if you wanted. All three places you need it. That's up to you. Getting the same thing in multiple locations like this, to my knowledge, does not have any performance. Uh, it doesn't cause any performance issues because you're just grabbing the same value. Even if you were to drag off of this and put it in multiple places, it still has to grab the same value every time you go to use the operation. So really, you're doing the same thing. So whatever's neater for you, you can use it. But now that that's out of the way, let's just go over the logic without all that confusing stuff. Okay. So I'm changing the input buffer to loop. To It's not going to be a for each loop anymore. It's going to be a regular for loop. The reason for this is what I was saying earlier. For each loop grabs a copy of the index. If you've ever seen me have to do the set members in structure with a reference like we do in the animation blueprint when we want to say the character has used a command, that's because if you just do a for each loop and set the value uh, the array element value in the for each loop, you actually are setting a copy of that value. You're not setting the actual value that we have stored in the array. And that's not going to actually modify the value. And it's the same with removing. So we need to switch it to a regular for loop so we can grab the actual index out of the loop. The way I do this is I do input buffer, uh, I get the length and I subtract one from it because remember this, length returns the actual number of items in the array. If you have 10 items in the array, your indices are zero through nine. But if you put a 10 in, in a for loop, then you're gonna crash. There's not a 10th index. So you have to do length minus one to be your last index. I also learned about this halfway through. So feel free to use this. There's also a last index now in Unreal. I don't know how long that's been there, but you can actually just grab an array, drag off of this and say last index. And then you don't have to do length minus one. So I have some length minus ones in code. It's not going to hurt performance or anything, so you can leave them. But just for convenience, convenience sake, you can actually uh, just use this last index function they have now. And this will be good instead of having to get length and subtract from one every time. So just a convenient little function they added. All right. And then we do a regular for loop. So the way you do this is you type for loop, and you have to go into the flow control for loop and grab this one. Then you can just drag, uh, drag the last index into the last index spot in the for loop. And it'll start at zero and basically loop through all indices. It's just like a code for loop. So there's nothing really scary here, but we haven't really done a, a lot of regular for loops in Blueprint, so it is worth mentioning. Now, we're gonna go over the loop body first. 
So the loop body is going to do the same logic that we did in the past where we check to see if we want to remove it from the input buffer. So I grab the index, okay? And it splits off a few places, but I grab my input buffer and I, I type get, and you can get a copy or a reference here. It doesn't matter for when we're just checking a value. This is why this worked in the for each loop because we were just checking a value. So you can get a copy here if you want, but we are gonna need to get a reference um, later on or just remove the index, which is what we're doing. So uh, I got a reference if you wanna copy exactly what I did. Reference tends to be faster in my experience, but there might be some uh, cases where copies are actually faster. So feel free to double check me on that. And then just drag in your index from your for loop into the get. This will get the actual value at that index in the array. And we wanna grab the timestamp and we wanna check if it's less than get time seconds minus 0 0.2. Remember, you know, whether it's a number of frames or just a specific number of time, we're removing values from the input buffer after a specific amount of time has passed. And that's all we're doing here. So if this timestamp is less than this value, it's been in the input buffer for too long, and we basically want to ignore any sort of commands that come out of that, or any sort of commands that could come out of that, because, you know, if you just leave them in there forever, then yeah, it's gonna be really easy to perform commands. So we do have to cut it off. So we were already doing this in the past, so you, you're probably familiar with this. We just do a branch, and if it's true that this is less than this, then we go ahead and add it to an indice to remove. And this is the new thing. We are now going to be looping through, keeping track of what we want to remove, and then removing them once the loop is complete. And that's a much better way to actually remove elements from an array, because that way we're not trying to access it and update it at the same time. Okay. So this indices to remove, it's an integer array I made. I made it a local variable. Since we are in a function, you can make local variables and local variables are good because they fall out of scope once you leave the function. So it doesn't eat up your memory the whole time. You don't have all these different variables that are just holding all this data that are not getting used like 90% of the time. So you can just scroll down the left side, local variables plus local variable and then indices to remove Again, it's I just made an integer, select the type, and then you can click on the little pill here or whatever it is, and then make it the nine squares or the three by three, and then click that, and that's what makes it an array. We haven't done anything with it to this point, so this is the first time we're using it. Drag off of it, well, drag it into the scene, get it, and then drag off of it and do add unique. You can just do add as well. Add unique will just make sure we don't try and remove the same index twice, which is safer. So that's why I like add unique. And then you need to give it the value that you're adding at that uh, at that index. Well, just that you're adding to the array in general. So we're going to add the index coming from the for loop. Let's see, branches off, comes down here, comes over here and goes into add unique. So now we know what values we want to remove. Basically, we look at which ones are too old, and then we decide, okay, yeah, they can be removed from the array. Now, be very careful with this next part. We are gonna do this a very specific way, because remember, removing from arrays is dangerous. That's why we're making this whole change, because it was causing issues the way we had it. So think about this. Say I have an array, I'm gonna pull up pan again because this is genuinely very important, very important. All right, say we have an array, and I'm sorry for how ugly this is gonna be. Array equals, this is a bracket. Say we have zero, comma, wow, that's not a comma. One, comma, two, wow, comma, three. I know that looks like one, wow, that one and that two look really similar. Okay, one and two, this is supposed to be zero, one, two, three. Okay, and this is the end of the array. So we have zero at index zero, one at index one, two at index two, three at index three. That's not too bad, right? Now, all right, so say we remove inputs at the start of the array and we had kept track of the inputs that we wanted to remove. Say we want to remove, so R is the numbers we want to remove. We want to remove 
zero and three. Okay, we want to remove zero and three. Well, okay, so just do it. It's easy. Array then becomes, you know, we removed zero, so we got one, two, three. How are we going to remove three? If we removed zero as the first thing, we no longer have an index three. We have one is index zero, two is index one, three is index two. We no longer have an index three. So not only can you not remove the value you want, but now you just crashed. See ya. And that's not good. So we don't want to remove from the start of the array. We have to loop backward through the array to grab the right values to delete first. So if we want to do and actually, I realize I closed that, but uh, just a quick example. I'll write it again real quick, real quick. So say zero, one, two, three. Now, if we went backward through the, the logic and we remove three first, then we have zero, one, two. And then we can remove index zero and have one, two, which is what we want. This is good. So if we if we remove from the end of the array first, then we'll be okay. All right. Okay. So once the array has complete, once this for loop has completed, excuse me, right here, completed, then we can do the logic to actually remove the elements. We know it's safe and we have the values we want to get rid of. This will happen immediately after the loop is done. So there shouldn't be any surprise elements being added. And if there are, it should actually be okay. As long as we're not removing anything, you know, we're, we're going from the start, or excuse me, we're going from the end and then heading toward the start, we should be okay even if elements end up getting added to the input buffer in the meantime, because we'll still grab the last index first and then go toward the first index in the array that we want to remove. Okay, the way we do this, grab your indices to remove array. I got last index again, since I know this is a thing I can do now. And then I got another for loop, regular for loop, and pass this in as the last index. Now, for some reason, for some weird reason, Unreal does not seem to support, or they don't have a specific node for for loops going backward, going the other direction. You guys might not have seen this much yet, or maybe at all yet, but it's pretty common to have to do a for loop backward, where you're actually starting at the last index, subtracting every every time you iterate through the loop and then uh, the last index is actually your first index in your container it's like in your array it's, it's important you know a lot of times it's useful to to go backward through an array or to go backward through a container so loops will do that a lot of the time so the fact that unreal does not support that is a little bit weird but we can we can just uh, put in some logic here this is actually this method is actually directly from someone that is on the unreal forms that is uh, part of Epic's team. So this is basically the way they expect you to do it until they come up with a node for it. There's other ways to do it. So if, you, if you're familiar with this and you wanna do it, go for it. But this is their suggested method. So take your last index node and then bring a, do a integer minus integer and then grab the for loop index here and drag it into the other, the bottom node of the subtraction, and then use that for all the operations you want to do, as opposed to the index node. And you can see that I'm doing that here. I have my last index going into the subtraction. Index of the for loop is only used to go into this, and then we pass in the return value of that subtraction to the remove index. And this does, in fact, work. So it's a little confusing. It's a little strange, but uh, we're we're going backward. All this is doing is going backward through. The loop. Okay, we're grabbing the last index. We're subtracting from the current index, and then that's our that's our index to go backward through. So it's not really bad performance-wise to do this, and it gets us what we want. So this is perfect. Now the loop body on this loop. We grab our input buffer and we call something, or we call a function called remove index. Before we were just doing remove, but now that we have the value we want to remove and the index to remove it at, this is way safer and way smarter to do it this way. So call remove index and pass in the return value of this subtraction as the index. 
This will remove the value from the input buffer, and then we're good to go. At that point, we've successfully removed the value. It will no longer give us any trouble, and we won't have caused a crash because we already looped through it. We're not looping and removing at the same time. So excellent, this is excellent. Now, once this for loop is done, on completed here, we need to call clear of the indices to remove. We don't wanna have anything left in here, even though this is a local variable, just to be extra safe, I clear it. Because if you have anything left in there, you know, left over the next time we enter the function, or if for some reason, again, we loop through and something gets added to the array, you don't wanna have extra inputs in here that are removing values that you don't want. I mean, it just wouldn't make sense and it would cause some weird bugs that you're not really sure what's going on. If we just clear it once the loop is completed, it should be perfectly safe. And then now hopefully this makes more sense. I took out the remove logic and instead replaced it with this function. And then the rest is the same after for both of these events. And now at this point, um, I already did it, but because we finished the logic, if you want to make sure that you can test this correctly, add a command. Remember, when you're adding an input, make sure you add the correct number of commands. That way you have enough to support this and you don't crash. So set num, I've made seven, which means I have index zero through six. And so for index six, I add forward dash and I add two of the same inputs next to each other, forward and forward, and has used command to be false. Now we'll go over dashing logic very soon, perhaps the next episode, and we'll do backward dashes as well. But feel free to add these in. Feel free to change their inputs. Like if you wanna, if you wanna verify that everything is working as intended, we can go do a quick, quick change, and do backward and backward, just like this. And now when we get into the game, it'll say forward dash, of course, because that's what we named it. But we can actually go in here. We can go to, we can save this and go to our output log. And then we can go backward, backward, and it says we're using a forward dash. So you see it's not just forward, forward working, it is all working. And one last test, we can do like light attack, light attack. We can do two actual attacks as opposed to, we can do input actions as opposed to input axes. So we'll try it again. Now remember, you can attack during the start there, so it actually would not work if you tried to do it there. But there you go, command is using forward dash. Now obviously, this is not forward dash, okay? It's very clear that this is not forward dash, but th that's just the name we put. Don't get confused by that. This should be forward, forward. And you can see that double inputs now work, and, and you can do more than two at this point. You can do as many as you want. You probably do up to like 55, I don't know. You probably do way more than that, but why would you, right? You don't need that many. All right, guys, so that's that's pretty much it for today's episode, but I feel pretty good about that. Having double inputs actually working is pretty solid. I feel pretty darn good. Uh, at this point, we really only need like charge attacks and then buffered input. Now, buffered input will come last just because of the nature of it. I wanna have all the other logic in place first. That way we don't have to add to it after we do that. I mean, we can if we have to, but preferably add as little as needed to do that. But yeah, so anyway, we can we can get into some charged and held inputs, and we'll get into dashes and all the dashing logic very soon. So thank you guys so much for watching. If this helped you, please subscribe. It does more for the channel than anything else I can do, and I just really appreciate it. it lets me know I was doing a good job, and I appreciate you sharing the same passion about this project that I am. I want to give a huge shout out to my Patreon supporters and my YouTube membership subscribers. Thank you guys so much, so much for the support. It really does help keep me working on these tutorials. Um, it do, they do take a pretty significant amount of time to, to work on every week. So I really do appreciate any extra support you're willing to give. And thank you so much. If you guys had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. It's always getting better. And I'm always trying to update it to make it as easy for everyone to use. So now we have separate channels. You can uh, ask more specific questions to the project or episode that you're working on and we'll be happy to get you sorted lastly guys if you want to come support us on twitch or come watch us live stream programming 
you can do both of those things. You can either come support me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash John the Road 27, where we do gaming streams and programming live streams. Or you can just check me out here every Friday, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do uh, live streams for a side scroller that I'm working on right now. It's a side scroller tutorial, so you can follow along with it if you'd like. I do everything live, so if that's easier for you than looking at code that I've already put in place before the episode, that should help. Anyway, guys, that's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.